Heavenly Father, as we take up this next presentation, we once again ask that you would bless our study with clarity, with understanding, um, control the words that are spoken up front, that they might be honest and for your honor and glory. We ask that uh, the truth that you have for us here um, would be understood and applied in each of our um, experience and in our understanding that we would have the ability to share these things with those around us. We want to understand these things in a clear and simple fashion. Help us to do so now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We're attempting to prepare the, the foundational premises to bring a conclusion to this study together, and the conclusion to this study has to do with the, the relevant, relevance and significance of the 1843 chart here at the end of the world. Our first three presentations were dealing with the subject of the daily in the book of Daniel, um, particularly from the perspective of the pioneer understanding of the daily in the book of Daniel. And now we're taking up another section of preparation for considering this chart down the road in our studies. And um, we're basically going to look at some truths in the book of Daniel, not, not necessarily everything that we look at here isn't necessarily going to be an established pioneer understanding. It's just going to be understanding that's in the book of Daniel. And... Uh, a certain amount of this may be a little bit repetitious and it may be a little bit um, redundant, but we're going to wade through it anyway and, and we will have formed a basis that we can um, refer back to when we get to the conclusion. When we get to the conclusion, uh, we're not there yet, so I don't expect anyone to um, say amen to what I'm going to give you a brief overview here at the, at the beginning. I'm not defending anything, but... In the book of Daniel, there are two themes, and these two themes occur in a variety of ways. Uh, we're going to demonstrate by the time we get to the conclusion that um, the, the 2,520 year time prophecy, which is the longest time prophecy in the Bible, that it occurs twice. It was a punishment. It's the, it's the sentence. If, uh, if the sentence is 10 years for robbing a bank, um, if I rob a bank, I get 10 years. And if you rob a bank, you get 10 years. The 2,520-year uh, time prophecy of Leviticus 26 is the punishment that God identified should ancient Israel break the covenant. And uh, before they reached that point in time, ancient Israel had been divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So the Millerites understood this punishment very well, well enough that they put it on this chart, which Sister White says was directed by the hand of the Lord, and the figures on this chart should not be altered. That's Sister White's word. But William Miller started, the, the date that he started this time prophecy of 2520 was the point that the southern kingdom of Judah was carried into captivity in Babylon, and that is the year 677. Miller concluded that time prophecy in the year 1843, and he was incorrect. This is one of the mistakes in the figures that the Lord held his hand over, because when it came to these long time prophecies on this chart, what was it that William Miller missed? He missed the year zero. And when you factor that into not only the 2300-day prophecy, but also the 2520, Miller had both of them concluding in 1843, but in reality they should have been concluding in 1844. In 1850, Hiram Edson um, did a study. It's in your notes. His complete series of articles is in the notes, 50-some um, pages, I believe, where he concluded, that, no, William Miller was incorrect. William Miller should have started the 2,520-year time prophecy, not when the southern kingdom was carried away into captivity in 677, but when the northern kingdom, Israel, the ten northern tribes, was carried into captivity by Assyria, 2 Kings chapter 17, and that date was the year 723. And if you take 723 and add 2,520 years to it, you come to 1798. Um, so Hiram Edson argues that, you know, what's the, this indignation, this curse of Moses, 
In Leviticus 26, it's under discussion in the 2520-year time prophecy, is emphasizing two desolating powers. And this is an agreement with Daniel, particularly Daniel 8. First, paganism would trample down God's people. Then papalism would trample down God's people. So when I, Hiram Edson takes the date 723 as the, the starting point and comes to 1798, it's amazing that the middle of that time prophecy is 538, and suddenly you see that the 2520, uh, according to Hiram Edson's reasoning, is dividing the trampling down of God's people and fulfillment of this indignation in Leviticus 26 into two 1260-year times periods. Beginning in 723, it concludes in 538, and then another 1260 takes you to 1798. And brothers and sisters, there's no way that that's an accident. So Hiram Edson in 1850 came out with a series of articles where he clarified this subject and demonstrated that William Miller was wrong. But you know what? They were both right. Because you had a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, and they both robbed the bank. So they both got the punishment of the, the jail sentence. And the jail sentence is very clearly laid out. 2,520 years. So the northern kingdom begins in 723, and the 2520 begins, ends in 1798, and the southern kingdom begins in 677, as William Miller says, and it ends in 1844, as William Miller missed by one year. But nevertheless, these two time prophecies, one time prophecy on two kingdoms, the northern and the southern kingdom, one of them's emphasizing the trampling down of God's people, the two desolating powers that are going to trample down God's people if they're disobedience, disobedient to the covenant. That's, that's the 2520 that begins in 723 and ends in 1798. The other time prophecy, beginning in 677 and 1844, it's not emphasizing the trampling down. It's emphasizing the law that was broken because it's very clear in the writings of Moses that the reason this time prophecy was brought against Israel was because they broke the covenant. That's, that's the primary argument in the, in the curse of Moses is if you're, and the blessing of Moses. If you're obedient to the covenant, I'm going to pour these blessings on you. If you disobey the covenant, this is the punishment, and one of the punishments is this time prophecy. So the 2520 that ends in 1798 and in the middle of it is 538 is the time prophecy that is emphasizing the desolating powers that trample down God's people. But the other one, the one that William Miller recognized, ending in 1844, the lesson that it's conveying is that the covenant was broken in 677, and in 1844, God again was going to raise up a covenant people. So these, these two time prophecies of 2,520 years are emphasizing two themes, the, tr the desolating powers that trample down God's people and the fact that God was going to raise up a denominated people on October 22, 1844. Now, brothers and sisters, these two themes are illustrated in a variety of ways in the book of Daniel, not just with these 2520. And I will remind you here again, and probably more than once before we quit, that in early writings, page 74, where Sister White is saying several things. She's saying this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered. She also says in there that the pioneers were correct on their understanding of the daily. But do you know what the chapter there is titled? It's called The Gathering. In the, in the paragraph where she says that the, the Lord ordained this chart, the first two-thirds of the paragraph, the first thing she says in this chapter, what is she talking about? She's talking about the scattering and the gathering, and it's during this 2,520 years that God's people were scattered. That's a term that Moses uses. That's a term the Bible prophets use. During this punishment of God's indignation against his people, they were scattered. And Sister White starts this chapter by emphasizing the scattering and says that we're now in the gathering time. And God intended to gather a people together once again at the end of the world and make them his covenant people. And he stretched forth his hand a second time, a second time, to gather a people together in 1844. And brothers and sisters, these themes in this chart that are 
mentioned in early writing 74, it's not an accident that they're the very themes that are connected with these prophecies of Daniel. These two themes are also run through the book of Daniel in another way. More than one other way, but we're going to take up another way now. And what are these two themes? I'm saying that two themes in the book of Daniel is one is a theme that emphasizes the enemy of God's people and the trampling down that takes place against God's people. And the other theme is the reinstatement of the covenant. The, even in the dates, in, in the two concluding dates of the 2520, 1798 is emphasizing the powers that persecute God's people. 1798, the papacy receives its deadly wound. It's the conclusion of two 1260-year periods. The first 1260-year period, paganism trampled down God and its people, ultimately destroying the temple in AD 70. The second 1260-year time period, the papacy persecutes God's people. 1798, the date itself, can be understood to be emphasizing the powers that are opposed to God and his people, whereas 1844 is emphasizing that God has once again brought together a denominated people. And another way that these two themes can be found in the book of Daniel, and your, your notes will begin this now, is in these two visions. The two words that are translated vision in, in the book of Daniel, one is chalzon, it's emphasizing duration, a long period of time of trampling down. In fact, in, in Daniel 8, verse 13, um, got a restrain myself or I'll, I'll go off course here. Verse 13 of Daniel 8. We're getting out of the notes here. It says, Then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation? The question here is concerning duration, but the word concerning tells us what the vision is about. It's about the daily and the transgression of desolation. And then the last part of the verse tells us what the daily and the transgression of desolation would do to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. The, the treading down of God's people and the sanctuary is carried out by two entities, the daily, paganism, transgression of desolation, papalism. This is a theme that runs through Daniel and this vision of duration, the child's own vision, the complete vision, it's emphasizing that. It's emphasizing the powers that trample down God's people. Why does that matter today, brothers and sisters? The foundational understandings of these truths matter because the power that placed the papacy on the throne of the earth in the past is it's prefiguring the work of the United States at the end. The persecutions of the past are prefiguring the persecutions at the end. If we're going to understand what's taking place with the United States and the persecution that's about to take place when the Sunday law arrives, then we must understand it based upon the history in the Bible that has prefigured this. So this, this isn't just interesting prophetic history. It's this history that lays out what's just ahead. We have nothing to fear, fear for the future except as we forget the Lord's leading in our past experience. We must understand these past histories. So... If you go through um, Daniel 8, which is on page 30, you will see the verses where either Chauzon or Mare is identified. And when uh, this is basically the verses where you find the word vision in Daniel 8, I have inserted complete next to the word vision that is Chauzon and snapshot next to the vision that is Mare. Um, We've went through a little bit of this, but this is in the record for you. Then you'll notice on page 30 it says Daniel 9. And in Daniel 9, verse 21 and verse 24, we see the word vision again, and it says this. Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even that the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the complete vision, at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he formed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am now come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Now notice this next phrase. Therefore understand the matter, and consider the snapshot vision. There are some in Adventism that say that when Gabriel here begins to 
give us the details of the 2300-year prophecy, because that's what comes next, that Daniel has been informed by Gabriel this information at this point, and therefore, at this point, Daniel, perhaps in reality or perhaps symbolically, understood the snapshot vision. He understood the Mare vision. And I disagree with that. It doesn't say that. The, the argument is made is that Gabriel comes to, to Daniel and says, therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. What I'm suggesting to you is that this matter here is the complete vision. We'll show you why in a minute. And it's here where Daniel understands the complete vision of the trampling down from the Medes and the Persians onward, the complete vision of duration in Daniel 8. But what Gabriel's saying is the only way you can understand that complete vision is if you consider the Mare vision in association with it. And maybe that distinction is not important to you. But when we get to Daniel chapter 10, we're specifically told there is where Daniel understands the snapshot vision. So I'd suggest to you that all Daniel is told here is to consider the Mare, the snapshot vision. He's told to understand the matter, and we will show you why we believe the matter is the Chao Zong vision as we proceed. Next page. Um, Daniel 10, verse 1, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the snapshot vision. This is where we're told that Daniel understands the Mare vision, which is the vision of Daniel 8, 14, the vision of Christ's appearance in the most holy place to begin the work of the investigative judgment. In the same chapter, in verses 7 and 8, it says, And I, Daniel, alone saw the Mare snapshot vision, for the men with, were, that were with me saw not the snapshot vision, but a great, great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was alone, and I saw this great snapshot vision. In verse 14 and 16 of Daniel 11, it says, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. Who's, who is his people in the latter days? It's us. It's us setting in this word. So th now th this idea of the vision, it's worth understanding because now we know it's dealing about us. It says, For yet the complete vision is for many days. And when he had spoken such words to me, I set my face toward the ground and became dumb. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O oh my Lord, by the snapshot vision, my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. In verse 14 of Daniel 11, very important verse. It says, and in those times, and all we're doing is, you know, surveying the different places in Daniel where the word vision occurs and making note of which vision it is. In verse 14 of Daniel 11, it says, And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the complete vision. The robbers of thy people here is Rome. And Rome is the prophetic subject that establishes the end time vision. Of course, you know, the daily in the book of Daniel is one of the components that allows you to have a clear understanding of Rome. And if you destroy the correct understanding of the daily, you destroy your ability to really fully understand Rome. And if you don't really fully understand Rome, then you're really not going to be able to understand the complete vision because Rome establishes the complete vision. And that's one of the reasons that Satan has attempted to destroy our understanding of the daily here at the end of the world. So in Testimonies to Ministers, page 112, You'll notice that, the, that Daniel chapter 8 is given to Daniel by the Ulai River. Um, that's one vision. And then Daniel's last vision. And Daniel's last vision is chapters 10, 11, and 12. There is no chapter breaks in that vision. It's just the translators of the Bible broke up Daniel's last vision into chapter 10, 11, and 12. But it's all the same vision. And that vision Daniel receives by the Hittical River. He receives the vision of chapter 8 by the Ulai in, in in terminology that we understand today, the Uli and the Hittical are the Tigris and Euphrates River. That's what they're called today. And uh, when the United States went into Iraq, one of the first palaces that they captured of Saddam Hussein, um, it happened to be 
at a, at a juncture where the, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers come together, and right where they were joining together, Saddam Hussein built a palace, and uh, m many Bible commentators suggest that it was right in this area where Daniel was receiving these visions. One time he was over this way next to the Tigris, one time he was right there by the Euphrates, right where they were coming together, only at that time period in history they were the Uli and the Hittical, and I'm suggesting that when you look very clear carefully at the prophetic information that's given in Daniel 8 and the prophetic information that's given in Daniel's last vision, then you have the, the information associated with the Uli and the information associated with the Hittical, and that that is also these two themes. The Hittical is emphasizing the final movements of the king of the north, the trampling down of God's people, and the, the information associated with the Uli is describing Christ's work in the most holy place. So you have, once again, these two themes, 1798, the papacy, 1844, the work of the high priest. So Sister White says in Testimonies to Ministers 112, the light that Daniel received from God was given especially for these last days, the visions he saw by the banks of the Uli and the Hittical, the great rivers of Shinar, are now in the process of fulfillment, and all the events foretold will soon come to pass. And the event in the Uli vision that is of most preeminence that is coming to pass is the work that Christ is doing in the most holy place. And the, the events in the vision of the Hittical that are of most preeminence are the last six verses of Daniel 11 describing how the papacy returns to take control of the earth. The first of those steps, verse 40, was the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. So if you s isolate out these different visions from the book of Daniel, if you turn to page 32, and you pull together the different verses where the complete vision is identified, and we won't read through this, you can pull this summary of what the, there are other things, but this is the primary things that seem important to me. The, the complete vision, the Chow Zone vision, when you summarize it down at the bottom of the page 32, you find out that the Chow Zone vision is the, is the vision of how long. It's, it's emphasizing duration. The vision that begins in the Medes and Persians and goes all the way through history. It's for many days, we're told. This vision, it's for many days. Um, it's dealing with the treading down of the sanctuary and the host. It's shut up till the time of the end. Um, it's sealed up, and it's the subject of Rome that establishes this vision. Now, on the next page, if you go through and pull together the verses that, where the Mare vision is found in the book of Daniel, and you have them there, um, for you, we won't read through them, but you'll see the summary at the bottom. Mare is emphasizing not a duration, but a point in time. Daniel sees um, the 2300-year prophecy. He sees this vision, the Mare vision. He sees the appearance of Christ in the most holy place. The primary definition of Mare is appearance. I'm the one that calls it snapshot. It's a point in time. It's not a du duration. It's the appearance of the man in one of these verses. It's the 2,300 years. It's the Day of Atonement prophecy. He only understands uh, the complete vision when he understands it in connection with the work that Christ is doing in the most holy place. If you're going to understand uh, correctly the, the history of the 2,300 years as Seventh-day Adventists do, you need to understand 1844. And that is why most people outside of Adventism, they really cannot come to grips with, with the history of the 2300-day prophecy. It's because they do not consider it in connection with the Mare, the appearance of Christ in the most holy place. This is what it is. It's the appearance of Christ. Now, the Mare vision, by, when you isolate where it's at in the book of Daniel, you, you can show very easily it's emphasizing Christ's appearance in the temple on October 22nd, 1844. And when Daniel sees this, he's overwhelmed. He, and he says so. He, he says so. He doesn't understand it. And if you go to Malachi 3, verses 1 through 5, which is a passage that Sister White clearly says is when Christ came to the most holy place on October 22nd, 1844, she says this passage in Malachi is describing the same event as uh, 
of, as the conclusion of the 2300 years, what does it say? It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. You know, the, the, the Bible emphasizes that when Jesus came to the most holy place in 1844, it was a sudden event, and it was. It took the Millerites totally off guard. They weren't expecting that. Um, and, and when you, when you raise, this is outside the scope of this study, but when you bring this passage into October 22nd, 1844, as Sister White does in their great controversy, who's the messenger that prepares the way? Who prepared God's people to, who was raised up to prepare God's people to enter into the most holy place experience on October 22nd, 1844? Ah, that's in a general sense. Let's get it, let's get it more specific. <laughs> William Miller was the, the one that the Lord raised up. Now, once you realize that, and you go back into other histories when when the Lord raised up men that did similar work to as William Miller, such as, Sister White says, William Miller is a type of John the Baptist. Sister White says William Miller was a type of Elijah. Once you realize who William Miller is, and you realize that William Miller is the one that determined through his own studies that the daily is paganism, it should give you a little pause before you move away from his understanding because he's a type of John the Baptist and a type of Elijah. You shouldn't so quickly throw his conclusions away because he is this messenger in Malachi when it says, Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Notice when Christ comes to his temple suddenly, which is within the definition of mare, it's the appearance, it's the point in time, that he's the messenger of the covenant. And on October 22nd, 1844, the Lord entered into a covenant with his people for the second time. The first time was at Sinai. The second time was on October 22nd, 1844. This is the message in the book of Daniel. This is the message that's represented on this chart that Sister White says was directed by the hand of the Lord. Now, there, Glenn and I have a friend, and Debbie and Kathy, a brother we know in Columbia, that names his children if Hebrew words. <laughs> He lives in a, a Spanish-speaking country, Colombia, and he names his children theological terms, Hebrew terms, but when he names them, he, he uses those Hebrew terms in the English language. He doesn't give them the, the actual Hebrew word. He gives them the Hebrew word once it's translated into English, and it's, uh, anyway, kind of different names down there in the Spanish world, and one of them is Hisset, and one of them is Sadak, and one of the, one that means righteousness, and I, f I forget those. But the third child is named Debar. And what does Debar mean in Hebrew? Debar is the word or the oracle. And Debar is found in Daniel 9.26. So if you would um, turn with me there, I want to show you why I believe that... Um, the child's own vision also is represented in a different way. In Daniel 9, um, 23, it should, your note says 26. On the, on the top of page 34, where it says matter, it says Daniel 9, 26. You should change that to 9, 23. In Daniel 9, 23, when Gabriel's coming to Daniel to give him the explanation of the 2300-year time prophecy of Daniel 8, Daniel, Gabriel says to Daniel, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter. And that Hebrew word that's translated as matter there is debar. Understand the debar and consider the mare, the snapshot vision. And, and many people here teach that Gabriel here gives Daniel understanding of the mare, but it, that isn't what it says. It says consider the mare and understand the debar, which here is translated as matter. But if you notice right underneath the word thing, in Daniel 10.1, the word thing occurs three times, and the word thing is also debar. 
It says, in the third year, Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing, Debar. If this was, if this was verse 23 of chapter 9, it wouldn't say a thing, it would say a matter. It's the same Hebrew word in both places, Debar, a thing, a matter. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing, Debar, was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing, the Debar, the matter, was true. But the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing, the Debar, the matter, and had understanding of the snapshot vision, the Mare vision. It is here in verse 1 of chapter 10 where we're told that Daniel understands the Mare vision, but this word Debar is assigned certain characteristics, and the, one of the things that is assigned to this debar, this thing, this matter here in verse 1, is that it is long. It's long, and we've already seen how the, the chow zone vision, one of the characteristics of the chow zone vision, this vision of duration, is that it's a long period of time. What I'm suggesting to you is that in Daniel 9.23, when Gabriel comes to Daniel with the explanation of the vision, he's saying, understand the chow zone vision. Understand the word, is what he says in the Hebrew, and it gets translated as matter, by considering the mare vision. But here in chapter 10, verse 1, he's saying um, he has understanding here of both the chow zone vision, the debar, the oracle, the word, the matter, but he also has understanding of the Mari vision. Now, brothers and sisters, I know when I'm throwing these words around here that this is an easy place to get lost. But you go through this a few times and you start seeing that the Chowson vision and the Mari vision are basically just two themes. There are two themes in the book of Daniel. The Chowson vision, the duration of the trampling down, the Mari vision emphasizing October 22nd, 1844. And, and we know that when Gabriel comes in verse 23 of Daniel 9 to give the explanation of the 2300-year prophecy, that that history is this duration. It's the trampling down. That's, that's the, what is portrayed by Daniel from the beginning, 457, all the way to 1844. So when Daniel comes in verse 23 and he says, understand the Debar, and then he gives the explanation of that 2300 years of history, that's the Chow's own vision. That's the thing. Understand the matter. And the fact that the Hebrew word translated as matter in verse 23 is the same Hebrew word here in verse 1 of Daniel 10. It's just another place where Daniel is contrasting these two visions, emphasizing the two themes that are associated with the visions. And it's here in chapter 10 where we are told that Daniel understands the Mare vision. In the future... We are going to go through Daniel 10 and show that in Daniel 10, Daniel is representing the 144,000 who must have a personal um, confrontation, a personal experience with Jesus Christ, as Daniel does here in chapter 10. And it's through the understanding that it's the Mare vision that Daniel's understanding in chapter 10 that we can, we can prove this conclusively. It's Daniel's here understanding not a, a, a bunch of information in the Mare vision. Daniel here is representing those people that are, enter into the most holy place experience with Christ during the Day of Atonement. That's why he's on a fast. That's why there were people there with him that didn't see the vision. And they left during the shaking or the quaking, as it says. There, those of us in, in Adventism that have the call to enter into the most holy place, there's going to be two groups of us, the wise and foolish virgins, the Philadelphians, the Laodiceans, the saved, the lost, however you want to break the two groups of it. And the bottom line is, is that those that receive the seal of God will have entered into the most holy place experience with Jesus Christ and had a personal experience with him. And those of us that refuse to do so, when the Sunday law comes, we're shaken out. And that's what's illustrated in, in chapter 10 here. So... I know this is a little bit theoretical here, but we need to put it into the record um, for, for the development of where we're going. Now, if you go down to the bottom of page 34, um, you'll see other places in Scripture where the mare, the, what's the mare? The mare is emphasizing the appearance of Christ in the most holy place. It so overwhelmed Daniel. The appearance of Christ in the most holy place on October 22nd when Malachi says he came suddenly to the temple, the messenger of the covenant. 
in Ezekiel 43, verses 1 through 4, Ezekiel has, uh, uh, is symbolizing those people that see Christ in the sanctuary. And, and no one argues that. It says, Afterwards, he brought me to the gate, even to the gate that looked toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like the vo- noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. And it was according to the appearance of the snapshot vision which I saw even according to the snapshot vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the snapshot vision that I saw by the river Chabar, and I fell upon my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. When Ezekiel is representing God's people at the end of the world, when he has his revelation of seeing Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, which is a parallel to what Daniel sees, and he talks about it as a vision. He doesn't talk about the chow zone vision, the trampling down of duration. He's talking about the Mari vision, the appearance of Christ in the most holy place. And it's, so it's not just in the book of Daniel. The Mari vision is when you see Christ in the most holy place. You see in the next page, Ezekiel 8, 1 through 4, that he is seeing the vision of the, the sanctuary once again. And if you look at the very last phrase there, verse 4, it says, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the Mari vision, the snapshot vision. The glory of the Lord is the, the representation of Christ performing his work in the most holy place in the time of judgment. That's the Mari vision in scriptures. The Mari vision in scriptures, it's a theme that doesn't just run through the book of Daniel, it runs through the scriptures. The Mari vision is emphasizing Christ in the most holy place. And Christ, when he comes into the most holy place, according to Malachi, is the messenger of the covenant. 1844 is emphasizing a covenant is being reinstated when? The covenant is being reinstated at the last end of the indignation. That's Daniel 8.19. Daniel 8.19 says at the time appointed, it will be the last end of the indignation. The the grammatical structure of that verse, Daniel 8.19, if there's a last end of the indignation, there must be a first end of the indignation. And the first end of God's indignation was 17.98, the first 25.20. The last end of the indignation is 18.44. The last end of the indignation is the time appointed, the end of a time prophecy, and it is here where Christ suddenly comes into his temple to reestablish the covenant that was broken that brought about the 2,520 years of God's indignation. Am I losing you all here? I hope not. But it's okay, because we're going to build on this a few times. Let's look at the Chow Zone vision in Scripture. I'm on page 35. It says, the people perish. Proverbs 29, 18, when there, where there is no complete vision, the vision of the trampling down, the people perish. Now, brothers and sisters, when you're sharing Bible prophecy, and I'm not sure that I do it correctly, but when I share Bible prophecy, invariably, I'm showing the events connected with the close of probation. I'm taking Bible prophecy and attempting to help people see that the work that the United States is doing today has been prefigured by the work that pagan Rome did in placing the papacy on the throne of the earth. I'm showing, I'm attempting to show that the Sunday law is imminent and probation is about to close. I'm emphasizing those events that lead to the close of probation and invariably I have brothers and sisters in the audience that come up to me correctly and say, you know, what you're saying is really scary, but when is it that you... You tell us how to have the experience that we need to be among the 144,000 because there are two themes. There's the events that prove that probation's about to close and then it's the, inf- the truth that we need to have the experience to receive the seal of God. There's two things that need to be taught. And so my response generally is to those brothers and sisters is that, you know, I understand. We need to emphasize the experience as well. But what is the Lord has put on my heart is lay out the events because those events are what the Holy Spirit uses to awaken you and I that if we don't prepare, we're going to be lost and we need to be awakened before we can even begin to to enter into doing the work necessary to attain that experience. That's my logic. But here I want you to see something. In Proverbs 29, 18, it says, where there is no complete vision, the people perish. It doesn't say where there is no mare vision. 
The 144,000 have to understand both, brothers and sisters. That's what Scripture teaches. The 144,000 cannot just have the experience. The 144,000 will also they'll have the experience, but they're the people that understand the complete vision because they're the people that are given the final warning message. You have to have both as the 144,000. You have to have both. That's what Scripture and Spirit of Prophecy teaches. In Hosea 4, 6, it says, My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. And in Daniel 12, 4, it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, brothers and sisters, in Daniel 12, Daniel very specifically says that the, the complete vision, the child's own vision, the information, the events in the book of Daniel are sealed up till when? That's all he says, though. That's all he says in terms of the sealing up. In Daniel 12, all it's saying is that these events are sealed until the time of the end. He doesn't say at what point in history they are sealed. In Daniel 12, it doesn't say they were sealed at this point in history and in the time of the end they'll be unsealed. In Daniel 12, all it says is that they're sealed until the time of the end. When were they sealed up? When were they sealed up? Now, this seems kind of minor and mundane, but I believe it's more than that. If you turn to Daniel 9, verse 24, it says 70 weeks, and this is something that every Seventh-day Adventist is required to know because this is the breakdown of the 2300-year prophecy, which is the foundation of Adventism. Verse 24 says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the child's own vision. When was this 70 weeks finished? This verse is given its a point in time. When, when is this verse identifying? Stoning of Stephen? At the stoning of Stephen, the child's own vision of Daniel was sealed up. When was it sealed up to? Till the time of the end, according to Daniel 12. Uh, how, many, how many Protestants in history from AD 34 until 1798 had a clear understanding of the history of the 2300-day prophecy? None. It was sealed up at the stoning of Stephen. But what I want you to see is one more thing, just one more thing in this verse. It says, seal up... Um, the vision and prophecy. Take your strong con Strong's concordance and look up the word prophecy. This Hebrew word that is translated prophecy here, it occurs many, many times in the Bible. Many times. I I'm tempted, I didn't count, I'm tempted to say over 100 times this Hebrew word occurs. But it's so many when you look up in your concordance, you'll see over and over again this Hebrew word occurs and there's only one place where it's translated as prophecy. You know where that is? Right here. Right here in this verse. It says, seal up the vision and prophecy. In the other places it occurs in the Bible, it's always translated as the same, a different, but it's the same thing. Every other time it's translated one way. You know what it says in the other places? Prophet. At the stoning of Stephen, the spirit of prophecy was sealed up. Until... What took place at the stoning of Stephen? The covenant people were divorced of God and the gift of prophecy for God's people was sealed up until the time period when once again the Lord was going to raise up a covenant people. When was that? 1844, the gift of prophecy returned because God had entered into a covenant relationship with his people again. This is the only place that it's translated as prophecy. It's saying seal up the vision and the prophets. Now, I'm not saying that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John didn't live beyond A.D. 34 and have the gift of prophecy. They, they did, but once they were laid to rest, once John the Revelator was laid to rest, the prophetic ministry was set aside until 1844. That's off the subject, but what happens in the time of the end is the, the, the subject of this chart and Sister White's confirming this chart. She's doing it in the context of the scattering and the gathering. And in 1844, the Lord has set forth his hand a second time to gather his people unto himself. In this time period, he unseals the vision and he reinstates the ministry of prophecy to his covenant people. So this is all part of what we need to understand. It's all there in the book of Daniel. 
In, uh, if you take the complete vision, the child's own vision, which we're suggesting represents the trampling down of God's people by the enemies of God's people, you'll see Isaiah talking about the complete vision. And it's a grievous vision. And brothers and sisters, it is. When you're talking about the, the trampling down, when you're talking about the, the prophetic role of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, and papal Rome, you're talking about the trampling down. And those prophetic histories are what, are t- what teach us what's going to take place in the persecution of the Sunday law. It's a grievous vision. It's a grievous vision. If someone's presenting prophecy correctly, they're pre- presenting the information contained in the duration vision, the vision of the trampling down, then they're coming at you and they're saying probation's about to close and we're about to go into the greatest time of trouble there's ever been. And brothers and sisters, you may think I'm amplifying this point above what should be, but the Bible's very specific. At this time period, when this is the message of the hour, many, if not most, in God's church, the message that they will be given is what the Bible calls a message of peace and safety. When in reality, we're to be giving a grievous vision, a warning message, a message more pointed than even John the Baptist, according to Sister White. This is all understood as you trace the words vision through the book. In Habakkuk, page 36, Habakkuk 2, 1 to 4, it says, and brothers and sisters, the next two passages in Habakkuk and Ezekiel were understood to be present truth in the Millerite time period, and therefore I submit to you that they will somehow be present truth at the end of the world because the Millerite time period is repeated to the very letter. And the Millerites understood Habakkuk 2, 1 through 4 as present truth. It was the reason that they were inspired to develop this chart, which Sister White says was directed by the hand of the Lord. How did he direct them to do that? From this passage. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the complete vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it, for the complete vision is yet for the appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. We have much to say about this passage as we can go go on further in this study. But notice the next passage, which was also understand as present truth to the Millerites, and is also dealing with the complete Chow's own vision of the trampling down. Son of man, what is the proverb that you have in the land of Israel saying the days are prolonged and every complete vision faileth? Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say unto them, the days are at hand, and the effect of every complete vision... For there shall be no more any vain, complete vision, nor flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall be no more prolonged. For in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word, and will perform it, saith the Lord. Again, the word of the Lord came came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, they that... They of the house of Israel say the complete vision that he seeth is for many days to come, and he prophesy of the times that are far off. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, there shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, saith the Lord God. Brothers and sisters, in the Millerite time period, these two passages of Scripture were understood as present truth, and it was what convicted the Millerites to go out and proclaim the the midnight cry message because they, they understood that the vision that they had been proclaiming was about to come to pass. And when it's repeated at the end of the world, it will once again be present truth, and the message that God's people are proclaiming at the end of the world will suddenly reach a point in time where God's people understand that that vision is about to be fulfilled. And what's the vision at the end? Is it Daniel 8, 14? It's the Sunday law. When you get to a point in time, brothers and sisters, where you start seeing that Ezekiel 12 and Habakkuk 2 is once again present truth. You've reached the point of time where God promises there is no more delay in the Sunday law. At that point, God's people have the responsibility to write the vision and make it plain that he who readeth may run. 
Isaiah 29 talks about a deep sleep that's poured upon people in God's church because they cannot understand the complete vision and the complete vision is as a book that is sealed. And in verse 16, it tells why people in God's church can't understand the book that is sealed. The bottom of the page 36 has verse 16. Speaking of those in Adventism that cannot understand the sealed book at the end of the world because they're blind and they're drunk, it says, surely you're turning things of upside down shall be esteemed as potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not. Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding. Brothers and sisters, simple. What we've turned upside down that prevents us from understanding the message here at the end is the daily. The pioneers understood the daily to be a satanic work, and here at the end of the world, God's people are saying it's a godly work. It's been turned totally upside down, and it destroys our understanding of who Rome is, and Rome establishes the vision, and it's closed our eyes to see the message of the hour. We've turned it upside down, and in verse 16 says, um, Shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? What authority? do we have to say, no, the pioneers were incorrect on that, even if Sister White says they were correct. The Lord established this truth. And Sister White says that over and over again. She says the men that, that proclaimed the judgment hour cry were men of God's own selection that he raised up to establish these foundation truths. What right do we have at the end of the world to say, no, the Lord made a mistake here? That's what this verse is saying. And in, as they're making that criticism not against me or the pioneers or you, they're making it against the Lord. The Lord says what they do is they turn something upside down. And the daily is the key to put the book of Daniel right side up. And there are other places in Scripture where it talks about men who have done this and what their their Conclusion of prophecy is, you'll see one of them in Jeremiah 14. It says, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. Earlier, the, the complete vision at the end is a grievous vision, according to Isaiah, but here's a group of people saying, Oh, man, this isn't bad. We got peace coming. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false, complete vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophecy, prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not, yet they say sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you, that make you vain. They speak a complete vision of their own heart, and not at the mouth of the Lord. So the subject of these, of these visions is serious information once you start tracing it through God's word. You know, this is being on one side or the other of what the complete vision is or is not has eternal consequences. The same with the Mara vision. You either have that experience in the most holy place with Christ, and if you don't, you're lost. These two visions, the themes that they possess as they run through Scripture, they're not, they're not just a casual observation. Micah 3, 5 through 7. Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry peace, and he putteth not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. Therefore night shall be unto you, that you shall not have a complete vision, and it shall be dark unto you, that you shall not divine, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded, they shall cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. Serious information connected with the two visions. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we ask that you would grant us each the, the experience and the opportunity to come to understand the Chow Zone vision where we understand the events of history that are portraying the events that are taking place here and now. But we also, Lord, we need to have the Mare vision.
we need to enter into the most holy place. We need to come into it as you said that we come into it by setting aside every idol, every false way, and allow you to accomplish in us what has been the design and the, the story of all the prophets, to be among those that perfectly reflect your character here in this crisis at the end. And uh, this work is a work that cannot be accomplished by human beings. It only can be accomplished through your power. And we ask that you would grant us this power and grant us the desire to seek and take hold of that power that we can be among those at this time that uh, give this grievous vision clarity to a world that's dying. In Jesus' name, amen.